Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Would you go ahead and put the picture up? For those of you that didn't see, we have a guest with us here today. We brought Herbert. Now, I've talked about Herbert a number of times. So for those of you that, that don't know the story, uh, years ago when we were having our deck installed in the house, we needed to divert the water from the drain out from underneath the deck. So we dug a trench and we got about, oh, four feet from the end of where we wanted our trench to be and we hit a rock. And so we had flexible pipes. We moved about eight or 10 inches to one side and the rock didn't end. So we moved about eight or 10 inches to the other side and the rock didn't end. Well, that kind of got us going. Now it was me, Christopher Donovan, and Benjamin out there working. <clears throat> and uh, after about two and a half or three hours, we unearthed Herbert. This is Herbert. Okay? Now, I don't know how much Herbert weighs. A lot. But I've invited Herbert to be a part of our service today. So if you can't see Herbert, there's a picture of him up there. Now I'm going to stand on Herbert for just a minute so you get a little bit of an idea. Now I stand on Herbert. Okay? Now I want you to keep Herbert in mind. Okay? Um, two weeks ago, I was praying and um, see if I can get down without hurting myself. <clears throat> I felt like God kind of dropped some things into my heart. And I've been pondering those things, and uh, I'm going to share with you um, some of what He kind of sh showed me. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open to Acts chapter 2. And just kind of keep your finger there. So before we get going, I would like to say a huge thank you to Benjamin, Josh, Nick, Thaddeus, who helped me get Herbert loaded, <laughs> and then uh, the addition of Steve and Nathan and Luca helped us get Herbert unloaded and moved into church, okay? Um, If I were to ask you, in all honesty, how would you say the church in America is doing? Oh, I heard dead. Not enough. Lukewarm. Lukewarm. Why do you suppose that is? I mean, we have some of the most wide-ranging liberties of any country in the world. <clears throat> we have freedom such as some countries have never known. And it would seem that in a place this open that the church would flourish, that it would grow, that it would, would be a powerhouse. <clears throat> so why is it that in America we see a church that is divided, that is anemic, that is compromised, that is complacent, that is dead, that is lukewarm. Why is that? We take it for granted, and then the devil has room to work. Yep. For those of you that have seen God's Not Dead, you'll know what I'm referring to. But uh, in God's Not Dead, there's this young man, he's uh, very well off, moved up in the world, uh, high position in his company, he's become, getting ready to become a partner. He's got pretty much everything that you could think of. And he knows it. And his mother, who is a Christian, who believes the Bible and raised her children to be the same, is suffering from dementia. And so he goes to talk to his mom and he's just kind of talking out loud because she's not really responsive, she doesn't really engage, and he's talking about 
the difference between their two places in life and how she is one of the best people he has ever known and look where she's at look the condition that you're in you know you can't even remember from one meal to the next what you ate you can't remember your own children and he said and, and, and here I am one of the meanest people around and I've got it all and I think it's a very poignant point in the movie where she begins to speak to him and tells him that sometimes the devil encages us in comfort. That the devil makes our lives comfortable, pleasurable, enjoyable, so that we never have need to go out of the cage. We never have a longing for anything other than what is in the prison with us. I think that the church in America has been killed by gold, by cushions, by privilege, by freedom. Now, you're going to say, freedom? Wait. Scripture tells us that we're free. That's not the freedom I'm talking about. I'm talking about the freedom that comes in being a citizen in the United States of America. Not that that is necessarily bad. But anything that in any way deviates us, turns us away from the narrow path, that path that God wants us on, that rock where our feet are firmly planted and secure, becomes bad. So, we're going to take a look at the birth of the Christian church. Okay, we're in Acts chapter 2. Jesus has ascended. <coughs> the disciples have looked up into the sky. You've got to feel for the disciples because the angels come and say, Hey, what are you looking for? Well, man, didn't you see him just float up there? He's going to come in the same way that he left. Now go and do what he told you to do. So they go. And we see at the very beginning of Acts chapter 2 that they're all together in one place. Now most likely this one place was the southern steps of the temple. Okay? We think that for a couple of reasons. One, because it was a gathering place for people as they went up into the temple. Now we've showed pictures about this. The, the steps going up into the temple are staggered. There'll be one short step and one long step. And then maybe two short steps and a long step. And the idea is that each time you come to a long step, you pause and you pray. You, you uh, sing one of the Psalms of Ascension. That's why they're called Psalms of Ascension. You are ascending up into the temple. Okay? And, and the idea is that no one should approach the temple in an unworthy manner. You should take your time. You should do it solemnly. You should do it with full understanding of what you're doing. Okay? So, they're on the southern steps. Another reason that we believe they're on the southern steps is because what Peter's going to say here in a little bit. Okay? But they're all in one place, and it says... Um, It was the day of Pentecost. That's another reason we believe they're on the southern steps because the Pentecost was a high day. So it would be logical they would be going up to the temple. Okay? And they're all together. And suddenly, whoosh, the Holy Spirit comes in. Okay? Now this is the promise. It's a fulfillment of the promise that Jesus had given them. It says when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you're going to do great things. Those great things are always with the intent to build the kingdom of God. Never to glorify the person. Okay? This is, this is part of the problem that I have with the charismatic movement where it kind of got off base. Is that It stopped being about the giver of the gifts and it started being about the receiver of the gifts. And all of a sudden people were receiving the accolades that were intended for God alone. Okay? Now that's not unique just to the charismatic movement. We have that in, in all different phases of, of the Christian churches. 
Uh, it's happened in the Baptist church. It's happened in the Methodist church. You get these men that God raises up and He uses them, and people start looking at the man rather than at the God that raised them up. Okay? So, the Spirit comes in, and they begin speaking in other tongues. Uh, people from all over the empire are gathered there for Pentecost, and they're hearing the gospel declared in their own language. And then they, they go, oh, wow, you know, these, these guys must be drunk. And then Peter gets up, and Peter gives the, the first exposition post-ascension. Peter gets the privilege of giving the first sermon. And he's speaking to Jews, and he tells them about the promise of the Messiah, the fulfillment of that promise, and their part in that. So now, we come down in verse 37. I'm going to pick up in verse 37. <coughs> so Acts chapter 2, verse 37. Peter has finished the delivering of the gospel. And it says, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. <coughs> Excuse me. A couple things I want to draw out here. This is the birth of the Christian church. Okay? And just as in any birth, along with the glory comes agony. Okay? Along with the delivering of the child, there is both pain and there is glory. And in the salvation of the soul, there's got to be pain before there can be glory. See, what, what do they say here? They hear the word given to them, and it says, and they were cut to the heart. They were pierced. Okay? Okay? See, when, when you come to God, this is one of those things that I tend to be very picky when I see people come to salvation. Because we have made it such a ridiculously nonsensical thing. Pray this certain prayer and you'll be saved. That's not what Scripture says. Okay? Ask Jesus into your heart and you will be saved. That's not what Scripture says. Okay? Well, what Scripture says is that first, there needs to be confession. Okay? Right here, they're confessing. They are cut to the heart. They feel the wounding of the Holy Spirit. Cutting through all the sin and making them aware of their desperate need for a Savior. For salvation. And they're confessing. We agree, what do we do? We're stuck. Confession simply means you agree with God. God says you're a sinner and you agree. I'm a sinner, you're right. I have failed. Oftentimes unknowingly, oftentimes with full knowledge. But after confession, comes repentance. Repentance is to turn away from. Okay? We, we, we have all these churchy terms that we use that a lot of times, as a church, people don't understand what we're talking about. Okay? Because we, we couch them in euphemisms that we find more comfortable. Okay? There's nothing comfortable about confession or repentance. Okay? Repentance is to turn away from your sin. 
Confession is you realize that it's sin, and repentance is to turn away from it. Okay? So we have, they are cut to the heart. The Holy Spirit was sent into this world to convict the world of sin. That's the cutting to the heart. It's cutting away all the callousness, cutting through all the ignorance, prodding that sensitive nerve, that, that place of rebellion, and making you aware that your death is imminent. But he doesn't leave us there. So they turn and they say, what do we do? And he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you. This is another reason that we believe it was on the southern steps. At the base of the southern steps were the ritual baths where they would go in to cleanse themselves before going into the temple. Now, Scripture tells us how many people are listening at this point. <clears throat> So we're going to jump ahead. Verse 41. So those who received his word were baptized. And there were added that day about 3,000 souls. 3,000. When we were in Israel, our tour guide said over and over again that nothing in the New Testament is new. It's all a fulfillment of something in the Old Testament. Okay? Um, why is 3,000 significant? What's that, Jeannie? That somebody died at the giving of the law. Yeah. Remember when uh, the law was given and, and Korah and the others rose up in rebellion and God said, I'm going to separate you out and I'm going to show you who is mine. 3,000 were lost that day. Okay? The giving of the law, 3,000 deaths. Scripture is very specific. God doesn't do things by half measure. When the Spirit has come, the fulfillment of the law has come, it's significant that where 3,000 were lost here, 3,000 were saved here. Okay? We don't get this because we have a distinctly Western way of thinking. We want to analyze all of the data. Okay? Um, we, we want to be able to quantify it and know exactly what little slot it goes in. When God reveals Himself <clears throat> over and over again uh, in Exodus, when God said, I will reveal myself, I will show myself to Pharaoh, I will show myself to Egypt, I will show myself to my people Israel, the word that He was using there for them to know Him was experientially. Okay? The difference between um, how we look at know and how they look at know is this. Um, uh, see Herbert up there? This is how we know things. We can look at the picture up there and go, well, it's a rock. Looks to be fairly large, white. Some people might be able to look at the picture and tell you the, the uh, geologically what type of rock it is. I don't care. It was in my way and it needed to move. Okay? But in order to really know Herbert, you got to come up and put your hands on him. You got to feel him. I would recommend. You help me move him. <laughs> okay? Because see, the picture only represents a two-dimensional view. Now, right here we have three-dimensional, but even looking at it, you don't know it. Let me, let me turn this around in another way. Um, how many of you have seen a picture of Abraham Lincoln? Some of you have not seen a picture of Abraham Lincoln? <laughs> wow. Let's try that again. How many of you have seen a picture of Abraham Lincoln? Okay. Now, how many of you know Abraham Lincoln? We know about Abraham Lincoln, don't we? 
We know a lot about Abraham Lincoln, but no one in here knows him. Okay? Now, see, as Christians, we can know about God by reading this word. But we come to know God experientially. The two work hand in glove. Okay? The one shows us the parameters by which he has revealed himself. So that when we deal experientially, we can know, is this God? Well, yeah, this tells us this is how he moves. Okay? So, <clears throat> the birth of the church. 3,000 souls were added that day. Verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day to day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. <clears throat> so, right here we see the birth of a new thing. God is establishing for himself the bride of Christ. <clears throat> and 2,000 years later, does the bride of Christ today look anything like the bride of Christ then? <clears throat> Folks, the devil has lulled us into a place of complacency and stupor. He has distracted us with gadgets and gizmos and entertainments. He has uh, stolen away our time. He has consumed our energy. And we have gone willingly. We have embraced the cultural ideal and in so doing we have given up much of what makes the church unique. We have given up much of what makes the church powerful. We have given up much of what the church has been called to do. See, Thursday before last does anybody remember what that Thursday was? National Day, of prayer. National Day of prayer. Kind of interesting in this country of pluralism <clears throat> and tolerance. We have a National Day of Prayer. <clears throat> we can't get people from the church in the church to pray. So we open our doors Thursday for the National Day of Prayer. And our numbers are right around 100 people between those that call church, Jesus Community Church home. <clears throat> we had 15 people gathered together for a National Day of Prayer. 15%. Now, prayer is one of the ways, one of two specific ways that God has given us to know Him. Unfortunately, in America, most of what prayer is, is presenting our wish list to God. 
We come and we want this and we want that and we want the other. And, and you look through the prayers through the New Testament, and even, even in the Old Testament, but specifically in the New Testament, do you know how rare it was that people prayed for specific things for themselves? Um, things, stuff. And yet in America, when we gather together to pray, it's all about gimme, 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 gimme. Now, we have a, a president that has changed the, the scope of the National Day of Prayer. And, and you know, quite honestly, I, I don't care. Uh, the, the National Day of Prayer here in Stevensville, they had a, an open time of prayer for people of all faiths to go down to uh, St. Mary's and pray. Why would I stand praying with somebody that's praying to a demon? Why would I do that? Why would I be interested in standing shoulder to shoulder with someone for the sake of talking to something that they don't understand and, and actually are opposed to? And yet, when the church is called to pray, 15% shows up. See, I brought Herbert here for a reason. I would like a volunteer. Riley, you'll do. <laughs> come here. And Cassie, come help her. Because she's going to need help. Okay, Herbert needs to go home. So <laughs> <laughs> Just go put him in the back of my truck, and I'll take care of it from there. <laughs> You're not that strong. Well, but see, in the church, this is what we ask. In the church, we have people who are gifted with intercession. It's kind of like people that are gifted with evangelism. Don't go anywhere, because you haven't done your task yet. <laughs> we assume that if somebody else is gifted with evangelism, that excuses me from having to witness. That's not a scriptural principle at all. We assume that if somebody is gifted with intercession, that excuses me from having to pray. It's not how it works. See, the burden that God has placed on the church... He gives it to us so we can turn right around and give it back to Him. Is it logical that I should expect that these two could put this back into my truck? Okay, we, we have about 40 people here, give or take. So if we take 15% and we put about six people on this rock. So can I just pick six people at random to move this rock? So let's see. I mean, if you guys were going to pick four other people, who would you pick? Don't worry, you don't have to say anything. <laughs> Six people? No, four more. Oh, four more. You guys are five and six. Oh, okay. <laughs> Caleb. No, no, you can stay there. Of course, he's got a bum shoulder. Okay. Here's my point. If we were to work together as a team, we could move a rock significantly larger than Herbert. You guys can go sit down. I want you to help me after church, though. <laughs> when God places a burden on a church, and the majority of the church is apathetic to the need 
to carry that burden back to Christ, the church becomes ineffective. And yet, when we gather for prayer on Wednesday nights, we average about 10 people. Now, I know, I know, everybody has excuses. Some of them are very good excuses. I know some of you have Bible study or other prayer meetings or, or things that you're involved in. I know a lot of you, you, you work hard during the day and when you come home, you're tired. I, I, I'm not trying to diminish that at all. What I'm trying to make you understand is that God has given us an important thing. We are repeatedly told throughout the New Testament that we are to pray. We are to pray without ceasing. We are to always be in prayer. We are to lift up the brothers and sisters in prayer. We are to pray for the salvation of those who do not yet know Him. We are to pray for the strengthening of the church. We are to pray for each other's strength and witnessing and testifying. And yet, when we come together, the spiritual pull, the spiritual muscle in this church falls to ten people. Now, when we work cooperatively, we can do incredible things, can't we? A couple years ago, we recited the church. And we had a number of people come out and help. We had, it went incredibly well. Nobody fell off the scaffolding. Um, Matthew only had to redo a couple of boards that I nailed up. I only nailed up a couple of boards. <laughs> so I was right on at 100%. But to be honest, it wasn't my end, it was Christopher's. <laughs> but see, when we allow ourselves to become so busy that the important things, the weighty things, the eternal things are allowed to fall to the side so we can enjoy or we can engage in the temporal the temporary the light do we have to wonder why the church is in the place it is? do, do we really have to wonder why the church is dead, why the church is apathetic, why the church is weak. When it's easier for us to say, you know what, I had a busy week, I had a long Saturday, I think I'm going to sleep in on Sunday. You know, Scripture calls us to come together. Do you know how easy it is for any little excuse to keep us out of church? Any little excuse to keep us out of brothers' meeting or the ladies' Bible study? Any little excuse to keep us out of prayer? And yet we wonder why the church is so ineffective. We wonder why this country is in the shape that it is. Because the church has abrogated its responsibility to being who God called it to be. We've grown fat and lazy. We're like that man in the Proverbs who's so lazy that he puts his hand in the dish and yet is too lazy to pull it out to put it in his mouth. And we complain because our political group isn't in power or the, the group that is in power isn't doing what we want them to do. Guys, it has nothing to do with politics and everything to do with spirituality. If the only time your Bible is open is when you bring it on Sunday, you are unprepared for battle. 
If the only time you pray is when you're gathered together on Sunday or maybe before your meals or in a hurry because you almost hit something, you are unprepared for battle. If the only time you are singing His praises is when you gather together on Sunday morning, you're unprepared for battle. See, God has given us all the tools that we need to be mighty. Scripture tells us that the weapons of our warfare are mighty for the tearing down of strongholds. And yet we have no weight because we're so easily distracted. See, uh, let's go back here now that I just closed this. Acts chapter 2. I want to point something out to you. Because see, I know some of you are thinking, Jeepers criminy, you're asking a lot of me. Do I believe that you need to be in church every time the door opens? No. But I believe that the majority of what you do that keeps you out of the church when the doors are open is not worth what you would get if you came to church. Okay? Now, unless you think I'm being legalistic, all right, let's look at how the early church was started. Let's look at what they did. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Okay? So, they went to church. They had church. They were taught. They fellowshiped. They shared meals. And they prayed. That doesn't sound too overly complicated, does it? Verse 46. <clears throat> and day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. How often were these people meeting together? Every day. Daily. Daily. How often were they breaking bread together? Every day. Daily. How often were they praying together? Why well, you guys are losing a little bit of steam. <laughs> See, the, the, the church in America has gotten off base. And, and I'll be one of the first to tell you, we have formalized and ritualized a lot of things that Scripture never told us to do the way that we're doing. Now, I'm not saying that the way we do it is wrong or even bad. It's just a lot of times we become so formalized and so ritualized that we forget the meaning of what we're doing, why we're doing it. Okay? That's one of those things that I, I, I'm very cautious about with communion. We belong to a church that served communion every week. And it got to the point where it was just pro forma. It was just a, a matter of course. You lost the meaning behind what you were doing because it was so normal. But see, when the church was birthed, it was birthed out of pain. They were pierced. It was born out of grace because after they were pierced and they confessed, they repented, they turned away. And then look at what the Spirit was inspiring them to do. All of these things. Think about this for a minute. How many of you would be willing to sell everything you had and put it in a pot to be used as needed. And, and I remember in Bible school, you know, because we, we discussed so theologically how this would not work today and why. And really, after listening to both sides argue back and forth, you know what I determined? It's because we are too 
damned selfish. Now, I'm not using damn as just a curse word. I'm using it as the curse word. It's our selfishness that has cursed us. Well, that wouldn't work. It's, it's not pragmatic. It, it's not realistic. And it will never work with attitudes like that. Now, I'm not telling you to go out and sell all your stuff. However, if God is, you better listen. If God is, you better listen. And I'll go you one further. I can guarantee you that each one of our households has stuff that God is requiring of us to get rid of because it's a distraction. God says, get rid of it. Get it out of the house. It's causing you to, to turn your focus from where your focus needs to be. You know how many elders we have in this church? You got Herbert. <laughs> He's our most effective one. We got one elder in this church. We have three deacons in this church. My prayer for three actually significantly longer, but very steadfastly for three years, is that God would raise up elders in this church. Now, let me qualify the difference between an elder and a deacon. The spiritual qualifications are exactly the same. Exactly the same. The qualifications that, that Paul lists in Timothy and Titus, as these are the men that are qualified for deacon, and these are the men that are qualified for elder, those qualifications are exactly the same. Joe, would you reach up and push that down button until the heater goes off? I thought it was just me. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, which one? Just the, the download. Just the download. Yeah. Until what? Sub-zero. <laughs> <laughs> Keep going. Okay. Is it safe to even shut The difference between the two is the calling. <clears throat> Elders or overseers or bishops are called, we see in, in Acts, they are called to preach and to pray. Those are the two areas that they primarily deal in. They are the ones that look after the spiritual matters, the health of the church, spiritually. Deacons, having the exact same qualifications, so you can't say, you know, you don't graduate from deacon to elder. That, that's not how it goes. Deacons have been given the task to look after the physical needs of the church. Because God understands and knows that we are a physical people. And so the deacons, having the exact same qualifications, but a different call. So where are the men that are qualified and have a heart to pray and preach? Do you know when the last time was we added a man to leadership? Me. About seven years ago. Now I know there's all kinds of excuses. I gave a lot of them. I gave a lot of them because when uh, Kelly and the leadership first approached me, I said no. Then I, I had my reasons. But if God has called you, why are you not serving? See, we've got a huge rock. Not only can we not get men into a position of elder, or even deacon, we can't even get people in to pray.
Why are we surprised when the burden is upon us? When Herbert stays camped? Why are we surprised when our dedication lasts the two, two and a half hours on a Sunday? We want to be like the church that God has called us to be. If we want to be the bride of Christ, we want to have the power and the authority that we see in the New Testament church, it comes at a cost. And that cost is denying yourself. Taking up your cross and following. And that means that sometimes, by golly, you're going to have to give up your activities. That means sometimes you're going to have to miss your show. That means sometimes there are going to be changes in your life. See, one of the most dangerous things that a Christian can ever experience is contentment with where they are. Hey, I'm okay. Things are going well for me. Just kind of cruising along. You know why you're cruising along? Because you're no threat. You're not a threat. Satan has got you right where he wants you. He's gilded your bars. He's cushioned your cot. And imprisoned you stay. I hate giving messages like today. I absolutely hate it. Because I know a lot of you are going to walk out that door and you're going to be offended at me. Now, I don't want you to be offended at me. I want to be your friend. I want us to be on good relations. But when I weigh in the balance our friendship and his pleasure. You lose. I'm sorry. Because I will always choose his pleasure. And I would that every Sunday I could get up and I could just speak messages of encouragement. But sometimes we've got to deal with the reality that God is not pleased with where we are. So I'm going to ask you this week, take some time. Get on your face before God. Not in your bed, on your pillow. Not in your recliner. Not in the place where you're comfortable. Get on your face before God. Seek Him. Wait on Him. He says that if you seek me, you will find me. Ask him what he would have of you. Now look, I'm not saying you have to be in our prayer meeting on Wednesday night. You want to go to another prayer meeting that's closer to home? Go there. But I'll tell you what, if the choice is between being here and watching some stupid program on TV... The answer should be readily apparent. You want the church in America to have power? You want this church to have power? There's a cost. There's a cost. Father, we bless you this morning. And Father, I thank you for her. Father, that you put things in our lives to strengthen us, to grow our faith, 
to purify us. Ask, Lord God, that your spirit would reveal truth to us today. Father, where conviction is needed, that your spirit would convict. Where comfort is needed, comfort would be given. Father, where there is weakness, you would strengthen. I ask, Lord God, that you would use us to accomplish your plan and your purposes. I ask, Father, that you would stir up within us a fire. Father, that we could not contain. God, I am asking that life would flow out from this church into the places of death. Father, that your light would pour out from us into the darkness. Father, that we would weigh in our minds those things in our life and that, Father, we would dispense, we would, we would get rid of anything that is found wanting. <laughs> Father, our years on this, this earth, our years in this life are few. Help us, Father, to not waste them. Help us to be about your business. Father, I ask, Lord God, that you would woo us, draw us, entice us into that place of growth and maturity. <coughs> that you would continue to reveal to us who you are. Father, that we would not just know about you, <coughs> but we would know you. <coughs> we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.